coming up on episode 114 of Australia's premier wine podcast, The Vincast, I chat with Kate McIntyre, MW. Hello there, Vincasters. Welcome to another episode, the first episode of 2017 of the Vincast. My name is James Gasbrook, otherwise known as the Intrepid Wino, uh, and it is great to have you on board for a new year, a new episode, uh, hopefully lots of awesome guests on the show this year, uh, and it's good to be back after a bit of a break. Um, I spent uh, New Year's and uh, a few weeks after that in uh, Japan, eating and drinking and, uh, you know, taking all the culture and history in. That was fantastic. Uh, but I'm really excited to um, to start releasing some more episodes. Uh, in fact, I've got a couple, uh, including this week's episode that I recorded uh, last year. Uh, and um, and so I finally I'm going to make them available to you. And so, yeah, this week's episode is with Kate McIntyre, MW. Uh, Kate's parents established Muraduka State on the Mornington Peninsula, uh, one of the first commercial uh, wine producers down there. Uh, but uh, she wasn't actually particularly interested in wine uh, until she went and travelled and then uh, started working in the wine industry when she came home uh, and then, you know, in her path to, uh, to wine uh, passion, she uh, decided to become a master of wine. Uh, so she talks about that on on this episode and about the establishment of Maruduka State and the direction it's heading in now. So uh, do stick around to the end so you can uh, find out how to get in touch with both Kate and myself to let us know if you enjoyed the episode. But until then, I'll see you on the other side. Kate, thank you for making some time. Uh, <laughs> I finally managed to, to get you on the show. My pleasure, um, James. And here we are next to the beautiful ish Mary, <laughs> Mary Creek uh, just after you've broadcast uh, for on Triple R yeah absolutely it's um, nice we've got some birds singing we've got some building going on it's a bit of urban urban paradise right here yeah absolutely <laughs> um, and yeah I mean I, I didn't even know that uh, there was a, a wine show but um, well but, it but comes and goes <laughs> <laughs> it comes and goes as a wine show it's Duncan Buchanan and Barney Flanders um, idea uh, called uh, Plonk, and they did it for a few years, about five or six years ago in yeah. the summer season. Yeah. And uh, a spot's come up on Sundays on Triple R, and so we put our hands up to do a month worth of Plonk. So yeah. just for November, um, we're doing we're doing Plonk again. We've brought it back. Well, definitely soak it in if you... Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if I'll be able to get this up uh, in time for people to listen to it, but I'll certainly be sharing it on the show, social media. Excellent. Um, and Kate, I usually start each episode of my podcast, uh, mm. speaking of casting, um, <laughs> by asking my guest if they can remember uh, the first interaction they had with wine that made them think about it in a different way and possibly mm. led them on the path to a career in the industry. Oh. Well, I've got a few, a few memorable wine um, memories. Uh, the, my, earliest, my earliest one was really was when my parents used to have dinner parties when I was just a little girl and I was allowed to stay up um, until the other guests arrived and they'd open the champagne and they'd all have a glass of champagne. I'd be allowed to have a little smell and a sip of dad's champagne. I thought it was pretty awesome. Um, and, uh, and I really, I, I was much too young to be, to be appreciating wine. I think I was probably about five or six at the time and I just thought it was delicious. So, um, that was my first, that's my first memory of actually tasting wine and thinking, Hey, this is pretty cool. Um, at the same dinner parties, I st I do also remember that my, my sisters and I used to get up early when mum and dad were having a little sleep in and we would, uh, we'd polish off the leftover chocolates and I would polish off the leftover dessert wine, <laughs> which would send me back to bed for a couple of hours after that. So it was probably a good way to get a little bit more of a sleep in for the parents. But no, it was, um, it was something I didn't, I didn't understand that it was an alcoholic beverage back then. I just thought it was, it smelt amazing and tasted amazing and, uh, I think I've always been a little bit in love with the aromas and flavours of wine um, for as long as I remember. And was that before or after your parents established Muraduck Estate on the Mornington Peninsula? It was before. We didn't have a lot of dinner parties for a while after mum and dad bought the property. So I was nine or ten when mum and dad bought the paddock that became Muraduck Estate on the Mornington Peninsula. 
Um, and uh, and then it became a little bit of a chore for a teenager. Uh, we didn't we didn't really my sisters and brother and I didn't really appreciate being dragged down to the winery, the vineyard every weekend um, during our teenage years. And uh, we all swore that we were going to get away from the wine industry as much as possible as soon as we left school, and that you know mum and dad would have to fend for themselves. So. Um, That's not an uncommon um, occurrence. <laughs> no, it's not. I'm sure it's not. And it's uh, and and I think, but I think that it gets in under your skin when you have that experience as a child. Because um, I remember when I was at university, I used to bring friends back for vintage, and we'd do a little bit of uh, we'd we'd do a little bit of picking and a lot of eating and drinking, and that was that made me a bit of a hero amongst the other uni students that I that I brought down and later on when I thought I was just getting a bit of a short-term job in a wine shop and people said oh your parents have got Maruduk Estate that was back in I think 96 I was a bit surprised that our wine was in the wine shop and that people rated it so highly and as I learnt more about other wines around the world and uh, started on my MW studies and all of that kind of thing I realised that it was actually a pretty special and precious place and thing that my mum and dad were doing and I, and I really it, it made me want to go back and be involved in it. I think it's important that you did go away and kind of tried your own thing to to be you know, have that absence as mm. they say which makes the heart grow fonder yeah. uh, to realize you know how important how special that was and I yeah. think that probably if you had have stayed ongoing and you mm. might have taken it for granted to a certain extent. Yeah, I think I might have taken it for granted. I might have resented it. I certainly probably wouldn't have gone on my own wine adventure, which was, you know, retail and then importing and studying for my MW. I probably, yeah, I think my path would have been very different and I probably wouldn't have valued it nearly as much. So as far as the establishment of Muraduka State, I guess so. your parents were very much interested in wine and food uh, before they bought the property. Um, what were, what um, business were your parents in before that? My father was a surgeon okay. um, and he and he was one of those he was one of those medical students when he was studying in Melbourne who would go to all the free wine tastings on a Saturday morning and not be able to afford to buy any of the wines. Um, and then working working in retail myself, we, we, you know, we kind of resented those people, but they usually grow up to be uh, good customers as they, as they start earning good money as, um, as well, working doctors. Once I have some disposable exactly, income. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and then we went to, we went to England um, for dad to finish his study and, and he got a job over there and we stayed for four years and he sort of fell in love with with the wines of the world over there, um, going to free tastings on Saturdays at Odd Bins um, in Oxford. And that was when he kind of came up with his plan. And mum wasn't really that keen on it when he first came up with it because she just wanted to go back to Melbourne and see her friends and have nice weekends off and have Sunday lunch with friends and family. Um, but dad was quite persuasive and stubborn about it. And when we came home, he we talked to a few people and we went... We um we went and picked grapes for um for John Mitchell at uh, Mount Mary. Yeah. And you know, being another ex doctor slash grape grower winemaker, um he he kind of gave Dad some advice and uh, and and we sort of saw how that worked for him. And at the same time, Dad met another guy called Gary Crittenden through some of his contacts. And Gary had been doing a lot of research. He was a he was he he was a nurseryman down on the Mornington Peninsula. He'd been doing a lot of research on um, the idea of growing grapes on the Mornington Peninsula. And he was looking for land. And he and Dad looked for land together. And he found his original vineyard site. Um, and Dad found Muraduck at the same time, and so um, they sort of were pioneering um, both the uh, the Dramana um, Dramana Estate uh, air space for growing grapes, and Dad in the Muraduck area of the Mornington Peninsula, because nobody was growing grapes for wine at all in those two in those two parts of the Mornington Peninsula back then. What was Muraduck Estate established to be just a, a hobby farm kind of thing? Yeah. Was it a part time thing? Did did he Dad's, plan to no, Dad throw himself this, into it full time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dad had this plan. You know, he as a young doctor and as a surgeon, um, you know, the hours are pretty pretty appalling, and they're expected to work very long hours on very little sleep. And and Dad had seen a lot of middle aged and older surgeons that were possibly not quite up to those sort of those sort of hours, and that sort of didn't. You know, you don't have that stamina when you're when you're getting older, 
and he wanted a second career so that he could transition from being a really good surgeon when he was doing that well to being something else that he did well rather than being a fading surgeon that people tried to keep away from the uh, the patients. He, he couldn't have so. picked a, an industry where he could make a little bit more money from? He was, ve- he was, he was um, very naive. <laughs> very I idealistic. think he's top- very idealistic, very naive. He thought that the wine industry was going to be a good industry to have as a second career and to make some money from. Um, and, uh, and he has, but it's taken him a lot longer than he expected it would. <laughs> what, what, did, uh, what was originally planted at Dramano Estate? At Dramano or Muradak? Oh, sorry, at, at, yeah. at Indramana, at yeah. Muradak Estate. At Muradak Estate, um, we uh, we planted a bit of everything. So we planted we planted Chardonnay, which we got right from the beginning. Um, we planted Cabernet, we planted Shiraz, we planted Pinot, but the clones were wrong. You know, when Dad Dad sort of said, "Oh, I've been drinking this Burgundy; it's pretty good in in England," and uh, it's pretty good. And I'd like to have a go at growing some Pinot Noir. Nobody's really doing much with that here in Australia. In 1982 when we bought the property and um, the, all the advice that he got was don't be stupid it's not going to work in the new world uh, it's a very fickle grape variety it'll only work in Burgundy and you're wasting your time. Did Burgundians say that? Burgundians said it Australian viticulturists said it. Well I, I can understand why Burgundians would probably say yeah. no, no 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 trust us it's no, not going to work worry, outside of don't Burgundy. Worry, don't. No no but um but there were a lot of Australian viticulturists who were, who were of the same opinion and um and, uh, yeah, so, and, and then, and then the advice that he was given about the clones to plant were completely wrong. So we planted a couple of Davis clones that were very neat growing vines. They looked beautiful in the vineyard, but, but produced pretty ordinary fruit. Right. Um, Aesthetically pleasing. Yeah. Yeah. Rather than, rather than being the flavors that you want. Um, yeah. So, so we planted a little bit of that. We planted a bit of Semillon, a bit of Sauvignon Blanc, a bit of, what else did we plant? A bit of Merlot? <laughs> bit of everything because as I said nobody had grown grapes for wine in our part of the world in the Muraduck sub-region of the Mornington Peninsula we don't really talk about sub-regions anymore but that's sort of that area in the northern part it's a bit flatter than a lot of um, a lot of the Mornington Peninsula it's a little bit warmer but the um, weather data that we got from the weather bureau was completely wrong as well because that had all been taken in a concreted backyard in Frankston. So we were Frankston. under, yeah, we were under, which is 15 minutes drive from us. It's quite a long way away from where we are. We're yeah. on top of a hill. So yeah. it was quite a lot cooler than we had expected. And so a region that was originally kind of touted as being sort of probably good for Bordeaux varieties has turned out to be a region that has worked well for Burgundy varieties, even though Burgundy is. Um, continental inland and the Mornington Peninsula is right on the uh, on the water. Um, I think that water that surrounds the three sides of the Mornington Peninsula is really important for keeping it keeping it cool and keeping it a good place to grow Chardonnay and Pinot. I know it's a somewhat contentious subject for some people in the industry, but uh, do you think that climate change may change that to a certain extent? Some of the varieties which historically may not have been suitable might actually become more suitable? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have a little bit of Shiraz still planted in our vineyard. Um, We got rid of our Cabernet. Um, It was quite nice, but it was very hard to sell. I remember it. I I bought bottles back in the day. It was more of a marketing decision than a quality wine decision getting rid of the Cabernet because we only have have 12 acres under vine. So so really the amount of space that we had for... um, for grape varieties that weren't pulling their weight and that were difficult to sell was nothing. So if if um, if uh, Cabernet wasn't going to sell as well as Pinot Noir, then it wasn't really worth keeping it. Fair it's enough. a shame. Fair I enough. mean, well, we've still got some of the older vintages and we actually, um, this year we celebrated 30 years of growing grapes and making wine from our own grapes at Muraduck. It was Dad's 70th birthday and we worked out that he, our first vintage had been his 40th birthday. So he opened a bottle of the first Cabernet that we made back 30 years ago and we thought it would be undrinkable, but it was actually quite delicious. That doesn't surprise me at all. Yeah. It doesn't surprise me at all. Um, I mean, I, I remember when I went to the Mornington Peninsula for the first time, I think it was 2005. Yeah. Um, and, you know, also on the same day that I visited Muradaka State, I also visited Main Ridge and, mm. and they still had you know, some, and they still do, I think some Merlot. Yeah. Um, and I remember then buying some stuff on the secondary market and, you know, finding some older vintages of, of Muraduck and Main Ridge yep. Cabernet thinking, 
oh my God. I mean, I, okay. Yeah. Murudak may be a little bit more suitable, but yeah. main ridge, red yeah, hill. Crazy. Come on. I know. That's way and that's cold. one of the coldest, uh, coldest sites on the peninsula main ridge. It's wonderful for, for Pino in the good years. But I remember, um, and another thing that was a bit of a revelation for me for the Mornington Peninsula was, um, you know, that Nat White used to grow Gewurztraminer. I did not know that. Uh, Unfortunately, it only set about one in every t- three or four years. Yeah. So it wasn't a very, it was not a very good grape variety to grow. Um, but my father opened for me about 10 years ago, his last bottle of, I think it was, I can't remember, it was in the late 80s, 88 Gewurztraminer, something like that. It was the best Australian Gewurztraminer I'd ever tasted. Wow. It taste, it smelt of rose petals. It was just stunning. So you know, it's a it's it's a it's a fickle thing. This this grape growing wine making business. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and what kind of influences was uh, was your dad or, or your parents mm. taking as far as the the direction as far as the wine making for Murdoch? I say was it just sort of yeah. talking to other people, tasting wines, yeah. trial and error. Yeah, so I, I guess I should say now that my my mother in the early days was not really that keen on the whole idea as I said before. And so her, so the deal breaker for her was she said, well, if you're going to have a vineyard and a winery, Richard, I would like to have a restaurant there one day. And I would like to try my hand at being a restaurateur. So she got that wish a few years later in, I think they built the restaurant in 99, 2000, and she ran a restaurant there for 10 years, which was great. So she has kept herself away from the winemaking side of things. So it really has been dad's thing. She now, she does the garden. She loves living there. She enjoys drinking the wine, but she keeps well out of the whole winemaking side of things. Yeah. Um, but dad, dad's not a trained winemaker. He's never done a winemaking course. He had um, Nat White uh, as his mentor for a while, for the first couple of years. Um, and he's done a lot of reading and he has quite a scientific mind. So it sort of came, it sort of came quite naturally to him, the, uh, the craft of, of winemaking. But but you and the up, art of winemaking, I guess. Yeah, but you grew up having little to no interest in in the wine, or I, well, did it just I seem like it worked to you? It. And, okay. it was free, free booze, you know. As a teenager and as a, in my early twenties, it was great. Um, but I didn't appreciate. I don't think I appreciated the quality of what Dad was doing for a, for quite a long time. And you certainly weren't geeking out about wine at that point. God no, no, no. Not at all. I wanted to be, I wanted to study languages and live in France and Italy and I wanted to write plays and direct plays and be a theatre person. Wow. That was what I, that was my dream going through school and I studied art, I did an arts degree at university. I studied French um, all the way through to honours year and I studied drama and theatre studies which was a new, which was a new course back then at Monash, kind of sprung from the English, um, English course. Yeah. So I had a ball at uni, um, putting on plays and speaking French and, you know, drinking free beer whenever VB <laughs> donated a, car, a keg for, for a um, uni party and going on ski IV and all of those fun things that, that I think all kids should do and less and less kids are doing these days because uni seems to be becoming more and more vocational. Um, but when I got to the end of it, I kind of, you know, I wrote a 10,000 word in French about the culture of food in France and how it's being affected by McDonald's. And when I, and I lived there for six months, um, in Lyon and, you know, Oh my God, the, the, as far as I'm concerned, the culinary capital of France. Yeah. But the irony is that I had no money. And so we drank really cheap rosé and Heineken beer because they were the, or Cronenberg beer because they were the cheapest options. Yeah. And that was when we were really treating ourselves. Um, and I went to Champagne for the first time uh, for, for a long weekend because um, one of my girlfriends, who, she and I, we had a long weekend. We couldn't go out of the country because our paperwork hadn't gone through yet um, for our temporary student visas. So we said, let's go to a wine region. We both like wine. We'll go somewhere where we can have a free tasting. That'll be good. And she didn't like red wine. So we bypassed Burgundy and went straight to Champagne. And I, it was the, it was February. It was cold. It was snowing. Um, it was a long weekend, so almost all the cellar doors were closed. Um, we went to Mum and Mercier, and both of those houses are not, you know, super highly regarded. But they were the beginning. H- historic, no, historically, no doubt, but, yes, but, but in corporate. modern times, um, they're a bit corporate. But I, we had a ball, and I've had a soft spot in my heart for both of those houses ever since then. Why not? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, so 
when did you kind of start to think differently about wine, start to appreciate mm-hmm. it? Was it when you came back to Australia and you would, or was it when yeah. you started working in retail? Yeah. I mean, I, 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 f- I finished uni and I got, uh, I had a summer job working for a caterer and I got sick of carrying plates and, you know, working. I worked at the first of the Victorian Grand Prix and that was my last, that was the last event that I did as a working in catering. Um, it was pretty it was it was pretty soulless and I didn't really enjoy it very much and I thought well okay I put my ap- application into the College of the Arts director's course and uh, um, the course before I found out whether I'd got in or not the course was cancelled because Jeff Kennett pulled the funding for the year so I had a year to fill in and I thought well I'll get a job I'll earn some money and then I'll go traveling in six months and go backpacking all the places that I haven't been to yet and so I thought, what can I do? I don't want to carry plates anymore. Um, retail sounds quite fun. I thought I could work in a bookshop because I really like books, or I could, I reckon I could blag my way into a job in a wine shop. Okay. And so that's what I did. And um, to the credit of uh, Philip Murphy, who who employed me, <laughs> um, I, I um, answered an ad in the newspaper. And I went in and they said, we're looking for someone who, you know, really wants to learn more about wine and who's bright and who's eager to, to do more. And I went, oh, yeah, and no, I really want a job in the wine industry. I want to learn more about wine. I'm not going to leave in six months and go traveling around the world. I, I basically, I lied. But they took me at my word and they gave me the job of assistant to the fine wine manager in the Turak store, which was their best store for imported wine and fine wine um, when those stores were, were, were operating. And, um, and I still remember my first day I went in, I went in the day before I started work to buy a bottle opener because I didn't have a bottle opener and to say hi to the people who were working there. And I just walked in, uh, it was like a, it was a, you know, a store full of wine and expensive wine and these people who were obviously very passionate about what they were working with. And within the first month of working there, I'd kind of, you know, I, I, I'd totally um, fallen for my own story and decided, well, I might as well make the most of this. And they sent me to tastings. I, I found out that I was very – I sort of had an idea that I had quite a good palate already, but I didn't really know how it kind of – how good it was compared to other people. And I, and I had a great curiosity for the wines that I was selling. So yeah. I spent my first paycheck on – a box of Italian wines, and uh, there was no looking back after that. It was awesome. Okay, and, and so the next stage in see, so I'm I'm assuming mm. that that sort of trip overseas did or didn't happen. Well, it did um, actually. It happened about a year later than I planned for it to, because okay. I ended up working in retail for five years for Philip Murphy's, but I did a, an Italian wine course with Michael Trembath um, about six months into working there and and it was again another eye-opener and at the last day of the course Michael and his wife Virginia said you know we go to Italy every year so if you found this course interesting and you'd like to find out more about Italian wine the best way to do it is to go to Italy so if you want to come and talk to us about joining us then um, then we can we can sort it out I went up to them and took them took them up on their offer and uh, and I went to Italy and I went for two, three weeks and spent the amount of money that I probably would have spent for six months backpacking on eating and drinking in Piedmont and Tuscany and going to Vin Italy. And it was awesome. I'm willing to bet you had a, probably a, a much more uh, it was fun a, time. It was a completely, because I'd been backpacking between school and uni um, and we'd done it really on the cheap, like two months, $2,000. We ate, you know, one meal a day and stayed in youth hostels and went back to some of the places that I'd been to on that trip and it was like going to a completely different world, going to these amazing restaurants and drinking 20-year-old Barolo that I knew nothing about but thought, wow, this is delicious and and, uh, and it was it was just awesome and I was completely hooked in and at the time Michael Trembath was studying for his MW and on that trip he said, hey Kate, you've got an inquiring mind and you're interested in studying, you should have a look at the MW program. Really? And yeah. how long into your wine career officially was that? Well, I signed up two years after I'd started working, oh, a year and a half after I started working in retail. It was kind of after I'd, it, I won a competition called the Negotiants Working with Wine competition in 98, 
And it was after that that I signed up for the MW. So, yeah, that was about three years into my into my retail my retail life. So after retail, you worked for for an import company. Yeah, I worked for Trimbath and Taylor. In oh, fact, there you go. Fun, so fun, so fun, that was enough. a that was a that was the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Um, and at, when Philip Murphy's uh, kind of expanded and then sold to uh, to vintage sellers, I. I really, I loved retail and I loved the power that we had um, at, at Philip Murphy's because we were given so much autonomy to buy and sell what we wanted as long as we could, you know, do good things for the, for the bottom line, for the store. So when there was talk about it being becoming part of vintage sellers and someone else telling us what we had to buy and that kind of thing, I thought that, was, that would be a good time to get out of, out of that side of things. And I had an opportunity to do some, had an opportunity to join Michael and Virginia at Trimbath and Taylor as their business development manager. Um, so I did that for three years and their business expanded hugely and, uh, and I had a few different roles along the way. And, um, and after that, uh, I, I realised I wasn't a very good wine rep. I, wholesaling and selling wine to people um, out on the road didn't suit my personality and at the time the f my family business needed me and I, I kind of made the decision to go back to Muraduck. Did you feel that you, you got a lot out of that experience though, as far as talking to the trade yeah. and, and liaising with um, suppliers in Italy and yeah. understanding about how yep. to communicate that, that, that probably would have been quite valuable for you? Absolutely, absolutely and I loved that. I loved it when we, yeah I think for me um, when it was a little only Italian wine company it suited me down to the ground because we had enough customers who understood what we were doing that you could have a few good calls in a day and maybe one or two where people would not buy any wine. Um, the business expanded uh, a lot and took on a big Australian portfolio and then that was when it kind of got a bit more uh, difficult because we had to try and sell to a lot more people and I found that difficult. I, I, don't, I don't take rejection very well so having making calls where people kind of go, oh no, why would I want to buy any of that wine? That's so you know, every day, <laughs> it's very upsetting, <laughs> and I don't, I don't, I don't rise to the challenge and go, oh, I've got to sell more wine to the next person or go back to those people and convince them. Yeah, it's it's getting, it seems to be getting tougher as well. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and just keeping ringing people and saying, can I come and see you, and them saying why. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It is. It's so that's okay. I, I I learned a lot about myself as well during that period. It's good to do things that you're not very good at sometimes. I think to to understand your own strengths and weaknesses in life. And um, I had a go at uh, making a living as a wine writer and worked out very quickly that that would be a really good way to kill my love of wine very quickly um, and live on the poverty line for a very long time. Most um, certainly, yeah. Yeah. So ha Having lived a high life, you know, being introduced by, by uh, Mr. Yeah. Trembath and, yes. and, and Virginia, you know, in Italy and then Absolutely. working for them, you would have been introduced to these beautiful Italian wines yeah. and eating at nice customers' restaurants yeah. to then go take that away from you. It's like, oh, that's not fair. Yeah, it's very so, sad. <laughs> so, so you decided that you wanted to go back and, and help with the family business. How, how, how much um, production was Muraduck bringing out at that point, oh. roughly? Um, it was actually, a, it was a probably... Had it grown much? Yeah, it had grown a lot and that was part of the problem because we'd had, Dad had had some not great advice um, from a previous distributor saying, make a cheaper wine and make as much of it as you can and we'll sell it all. And this was then our Devil Bend Creek wine and Dad went from making sort of 300 dozen of it one year to a thousand dozen bottles each of the Chardonnay and Pinot the following year yeah. on the advice of the distributor and then the wine not selling as well as they'd hoped it would because... Mum and Dad didn't have any, they had no market, no interest in marketing the wine. They were, again, it, you know, Dad coming from medicine, not having a business background, he believed that if he made good enough wine, then it would sell itself and that his distributor would be able to do enough of the promotional stuff that that would sell the wine. And that's just not the case. You need to, you need to have someone who's on message to talk about the wine and to, to promote the wine. Um, and to be able to do that above and beyond everything else. And I think for a little business like us, you know, when I came back, we were maybe producing um, six or 7,000 dozen bottles of wine and we kind of reduced it back to about 5,000 dozen bottles of wine now and we're just in a growth period now. So 
We never want to get over, we never want to get to 10,000 dozen bottles because that takes us into another another space um, where we are between sort of between five and eight thousand dozen bottles of wine it can be me and dad and Jeremy who's our other winemaker um, and, a, and someone in cellar door and someone in the office and that's all we need if we if we get much bigger than that then and it also means that we don't have to it means we don't have to sell to everybody we don't have to sell to the groups and chains if they insist on on a discount or a rebate we can say well we choose not to give you that discount or we choose not to pay that rebate and you can not sell our wine that's yeah. fine yeah um and that that works it, it's up it's up to you it's the up producer to and it's up to yeah. the distributor to strengthen that brand yeah, so absolutely. that people should want to pay as close to full yeah. price as possible because yeah. they need to have that brand. Absolutely. And uh, and we've we've got we've changed distributors again recently. We've had a couple of different distributors and we've had you know, our old distributors got got bigger than us and we got a little bit lost in their portfolio and they're lovely people and uh, but it wasn't working so it's changed for us again this year we've got new distributors we've got a different distributor in each state in Australia and it's working really well because they're small boutique um, companies they have a, an import section and we're getting back into a lot of the restaurants that we were maybe not getting into um, that we should have been in uh, in the last few years with with our previous distributors so you know it's it's not it's not a criticism of one style of distribution over another it's about finding the right fit and people can be I mean, absolutely lovely and have all the best intentions in the world but if the fit's not right then it's going to be it's going to be a bad situation for everyone involved absolutely you know in the same way that there are different sized wine wineries and wine producers yeah. there are different sized and style distributors in the same way they're different you know Absolutely. size and style on or off premise Absolutely. customers um so w when you came back to 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 you know rejoin or to join the family business mm. what, what 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 were some of the things that you wanted to kind of uh, improve upon and and, and evolve mm. to bring it you know into a, another realm well we were we were just in the process of negotiating the previous new distributors so that was something that I got involved with um, but more importantly for me was about getting the direct sales sorted so rewriting redoing the website and that took a couple of years um, just to kind of work out what we wanted to do and how we wanted to do it it's about growing cellar door um, cellar door access and cellar door sales and we grew that in in the last probably six years from maybe 5% of our total sales to about 40% of our total sales, which is where much closer to where it should be. Um, is, just sorry yeah. to interrupt, but is that a, a really, really important um, factor as far as uh, the, the tourism element yeah. of the Mornington Peninsula and uh, yeah. uh, uh, when you came on board, was uh, that part of the Mornington Peninsula quite uh, well mm -hmm. established as far as a number of producers who all had cellar doors and who were all getting kind of traffic through was that yeah was that important yeah I think there were I think there were a lot less cellar doors than we've got now even 10 years ago um, there's been a lot of change over the last 10 years and a lot more uh, professionalism in in cellar doors and that kind of thing mm -hmm. now than there than there were before um, uh, we were also at the stage where we were getting close to, you know, mum was running the restaurant um, and the restaurant was doing well, but it was That famous taking, pizza oven. I know, and it was, but it was taking, we weren't making wine sales with people who were coming to the restaurant because yeah. they weren't, we discovered they didn't have to walk through cellar door, either on the way in or on the way out. Yeah, okay. Wait, so, wait, hold on. Where... Uh, at the winery, where was the restaurant? So that was so the restaurant's in the main the house, cellar okay. and the cellar door is in the is in the winery. So uh, so yeah, the entrance was was different, and that was just that just showed how bad we were at thinking about the whole marketing idea when when things start off. And I have to say, I wasn't involved in that part of the uh, the business back then. So. We, we really kind of, but we were all a bit surprised because we thought, oh, well, people, you know, it wasn't, they walked past the door to sell the door to get into the restaurant. Yeah. But they weren't forced. It's like, you know, in a museum, people get forced to walk through the gift store on the way out. Well, what's that, um, the Banksy documentary, Exit Through the Gift Shop? Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly right. So, so if you, and that was just something that we hadn't even thought of and our architect hadn't thought of and nobody had really thought of. And we thought, well, if we have this beautiful restaurant, then surely people will you know, drink our, eat our food, drink our wine and, 
and then buy some wine on the way out. But usually they didn't. They spent all their money in the restaurant and then went, oh, that was nice. We'll have to come back to this restaurant someday. Yeah, yeah. I can tell you, you know, mm. having worked for Domaine Chandon, yeah. they most certainly thought about that because that was ah, the yeah. only way in and out was through. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, shop. look, look, I think that, um, I think I've got, I've got to say, and I, I love, I love my mum and dad and I think that dad has, has become an amazing winemaker, but the marketing side of things, they really, they really needed help with it. So, okay. and that was, and I'm not a trained marketeer. <laughs> I haven't done a marketing degree, but, 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 but a you, lot of it's logical. You had spent time in retail. You had and, spent time yes. in wholesale. I understood so you how had the rest of the industry to, works. Exactly. Yeah. And you had been a wine consumer yourself. Yeah. Um, you know, like I, I suppose when, when your dad was a wine consumer, mm. um, you know, wine shops weren't as kind of, um, sophisticated mm. as they sort of had to become, yeah. um, and cellar doors sort of didn't Absolutely. really exist. Uh, certainly not, you know, in, in Victoria. No. Um, so, so, you know, that's understandable. So yeah. I, I think that's probably an important part of what you, so if, 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 if it's been taken up to 40% yeah. of sales, it really yeah. does show you how important a really solid cellar door experience can be yeah. and, then, and then to actually capitalize on uh, you know doubt you have mailing lists and yes i'm working and hard like on making sure that the way the mailing list is an effective mailing list and that you're not just sending sending out you know family updates to a thousand family friends who you know who and that was really what our mailing list was for a long time it was a hard copy hard copy newsletter that went out to all of mum and dad's old friends who yep. never bought any wine. Yeah. And yeah. so, you know, that was just, there was oh, a lot it's of... nice to hear what they're lovely, up to. <laughs> lovely. But, you know, lots of things that needed to just be kind of tweaked. And it did, it was a lot of little tweaks to... And it meant that dad could concentrate on just making beautiful wine rather than worrying about how we were going to sell it. Um, and so tell me about the, the, the path to becoming a master of wine. Oh. When, when did it start a sort of slightly more full-time mm. uh, and um, and culminating in, I believe, 2010? Yeah, yeah. My path was pretty long and winding um, and there were a few false starts. I, I, as I said, I started, I actually signed up in 99 to the MW um, program, but I reckon I probably got serious about it probably in about 2004, 2005. Okay. Um, because I'd done enough study then and I'd kind of worked out what I didn't know and I kind of went, okay, I have to stop being a tourist and get on with it now. So by study, do you mean WSET? No, that wasn't available here back then. Okay. I could have gone to Perth and done it, but I wasn't Perth. that interested in doing that. Um, <laughs> that I'm, I, I am quite yeah. surprised to hear yeah. that Perth was the place you could do it in Australia. Yeah, Edith Cohen University offered it back in the 90s, but it w it's only been available in Melbourne for maybe not quite 10 years, I think. Okay. Um, so, in fact, we started offering level two and level three at, at um, the Prince Wine Store. So, I, sta I started um, working with them on offering WSET in, I think it was 07 or 08 when I was just fi finishing up with my MW. So, I'd passed the tasting exam by then and I was just trying to pass my dissertation. I, was, I wrote my dissertation. So... I took the longest time that you're actually legally allowed to take to pass the MW. I sat the theory three times. Before I passed it on my third go. And I sat the tasting five times, passed it on my fifth go. And uh, and then I had two goes at my dissertation. So um, some people would call that being a slow learner. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I had a bit of bad luck along the way, but I think also I just wasn't, I wasn't um, focused enough. Uh, but, I was but, but trying to there. learn too much at, you, at once. Did you did you have any mentors? Yeah. Uh, to NW so I, we sort of pushed look, you through. Look, my my official mentor is a beautiful man called Martin Williams, and he passed his MW the first time he sat the exam, and so he was very helpful with the technical stuff. He's brilliant. He's genius, but he couldn't understand why I couldn't just get on with it and pass it. And he said to me about my third third failure. Um, he said, "Okay, I really admire." I really admire um, your persistence because I reckon if I hadn't passed the first go, I probably wouldn't have gone back again. <laughs> like, oh, thanks. I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> but um, I had a lot of other unofficial mentors that kind of appointed themselves along the way and I had some really, really lovely support both from the MW community and also from family and friends. So I think the thing that got me through in the end for the tasting was I'd had tasting groups of people who were sort of 
hoping to one day do their MW but weren't quite there. So they came along to the tasting groups for me to teach them how to taste like an MW and it was getting to the stage that I was doing all the teaching and doing none of the learning and so we kind of gave up on that. And uh, my dad and Martin Spedding from 10 Minutes by Tractor and Hugh Robinson, who's a viticulturist and a friend, got together with a few other winemakers down on the peninsula and we put together uh, a tasting group, which was basically a get Kate to pass the MW tasting tasting group. So they would put together a, a mock exam for me that I'd do on Friday morning and do it as a timed exam with a proper paper. They did all of that stuff for me. And then they'd come over on Friday night and we'd do... We'd do the tasting together. I'd read out my answers. They'd all say how convincing they were or not. It was really good for me to hear my answers out loud as well. And then we'd have dinner together and they'd help pay for the wines. It was the only way I got through. It was really, it was a wonderful, wonderful support system. And we now go travelling, most of that group go travelling um, every three years or so to different favourite parts of mine of Europe. And I organise the trip and they come along and they pay their way. And we go to Burgundy and Champagne and Alsace and northern Italy, and next year we're going to Spain. So it's a, it it's a like really a, nice little group. Very much a win-win situation for everyone involved. Yeah, absolutely. But um, but so you've uh, been in NMW for the last six years, mm. and, and you are still obviously heavily involved uh, at Muradaka State, but you also yeah. do quite a bit of travel. Uh, yeah. You're speaking at uh, various events and conferences yeah. and whatnot. But, yeah. Uh, that's part of the reason why it has taken me a little while to be able to, to get I'm you on the I'm a bit elusive, aren't I? <laughs> no, absolutely. I mean, Jane Faulkner was very, very similar. Was, yeah. I, I keep mentioning it to her and I probably yeah. should stop because <laughs> she has apologized. You'll get her. You'll get her. <laughs> no, no, I, I had her on. Oh, you had her? I had oh, her yeah, on, yeah. yeah. Yep. Um, but look, Kate, uh, it has uh, been really, really great to chat with you and mm. hear more about your background and obviously about Muraduka State. I do highly recommend going down to the Mornington Peninsula um, particularly over summer because uh, yeah. it is a, a beautiful winery to visit and I think the wines have never been better. You know, I was always a big fan of the Chardonnay and I still think it is one of the yeah. best in Australia but uh, but across the board now, the, the wines are just really kicking goals. Thank you, James. I'm really, I'm really proud of what Dad's doing and, you know, he's, he's maturing, the vines are maturing and I think the quality of the wine is improving as a result and Fantastic. we're having a lot of fun. Uh, for people who want to, to um, check out more about Murudak Estates yeah. uh, and also on social media, yes. your, yours as well, if you wouldn't mind sharing Yeah, them. absolutely. So the website, the Murudak Estate website is very easy. It's www.murudak Estate and you spell that M-O-O-R-O-O-D-U-C. Estate. Just think of a cow and a kangaroo and a duck and run it together. Estate.com.au. Um, I tweet. Uh, I tweet for. I tweet and Instagram for Muraduck as at Muraduck Estate and my personal Twitter feed and Instagram feed is at Kate and PX. PX is my fourteen-year-old black poodle who is little black and sweet. So hence he is named Pedro Jimenez. Um, and yeah, we've got a Facebook page too. <laughs> Muraduck Estate. You got you got to be social these days. Yeah, but I know. Um, I know. Um, yeah, it's good. So definitely, guys, check it out. Follow Kate. Um, and you know, if you enjoyed the episode as much as I did, uh, please do get in contact with her and, and thank her in person. But uh, thanks very much, Kate. I look forward to catching up again soon. Thank you. It's been a delight. <laughs> And thank you, listeners, for joining us on this episode of The Vincast. I have been James Scarsbrook, otherwise known as The Intrepid Wino. I've got lots of awesome guests coming up on the show soon, so please make sure that you are subscribed to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Player FM, uh, Podbean, or any other podcast sharing app you might have. Uh, subscribing means you get the newest episode as soon as it becomes available uh, and it's also a great way to provide feedback by leaving a rating and a review which does help me a lot uh, and helps get the podcast to more listeners. Uh, I'd love for you to follow me on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter at Intrepid Wino and the podcast is on Twitter as well at The Vincast. Uh, come and ch uh, check out my YouTube channel which is Intrepid Wino, one word. Uh, I've got lots of videos on there uh, including previous episodes of the podcast, uh, lots and lots of Let's Taste videos uh, and, which I think I've tasted some Muraduck Estate wines on there uh, and also my wine making exploits which uh, I'm going to be doing again very very soon. I'm very excited about uh, this year's vintage uh, and of course all that information 
information is available at my website, intrepidwino.com. Uh, you'll find lots of different ways of getting in contact with me uh, and you can read about my past experiences traveling and, uh, and learning about wine. So thanks as always, guys. Uh, I really do hope you uh, um, stick around for future episodes of the show. But until next time, bye. Bye.